Well, I think, without a doubt, uh, there was no uh, hesitation at all to help this boy. Told that the, he could help him out, and he called Texas and got the help he needed. And without any cost at all to the family, they paid for flights to and from and put them up when they got here, fed them, and didn't cost them one cent. And uh, I don't know, but that kind of sets an example of what masonry is all about. It's not only for Masonic families and their members, but for non-members as well, those burn hospitals and your know, dyslexia centers and so forth. I joined the lodge right here in 1949. Bill Shamel. I live in Grand Lake Stream, Maine. I'm a retired Coast Guard warrant officer and I build canoes for a living. Yeah, I think the personal, personally that the climate right now is, is a tragedy. It's a national tragedy that people are so divided and so strongly entrenched in their beliefs no matter what they are. I think the country is more divided than I've ever seen it in my 70 years. I've got strong opinions because I've got some Native American in my background and <laughs> it's kind of interesting to see it from their point of view white people that came and displaced them a few hundred years ago claiming they've got a right to everything. I don't I think to try to stop it altogether is 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 wrong. I think that's just not what not not the way the United States came to be what it is. Sure we need to screen, we need to be careful and we've got the technology to do it. Uh, but to just arbitrarily say we're going to stop this group or that group because of this reason or that reason I think does does everybody especially the, the country as a whole an injustice. It's not what we were founded about. Well, we weren't without our problems, and I was in the service during during the. I'm a Vietnam era serviceman, although I never was there. Uh, and we went through the, I guess you'd call it growing pains of, of, uh, of trying to, uh, you know, engender better racial equality, and certainly women. I was around when the first women came in the service. Uh, it, I think, the service can be a model for how well, uh, you know, how well people can get along, and. You know, the opportunities that are presented to them, anybody can advance that wants to, uh, irrespective of, of anything, race, religion, sex. When I was in the, the service, uh, racism wasn't tolerated, sexism wasn't tolerated. Uh, any kind of discrimination at all wasn't tolerated, and uh, it, it was dealt, and we had the mechanisms to deal with it. Uh, we called it, at the, at the time I was in, we called it human relations training, but we worked on it and we worked hard. There, responsibility is not to blindly follow. Their responsibility is to be led by competent leadership and to lead by competent leadership. And ranting and raving and off-the-cuff remarks, they don't accomplish anything. I always want to come to Boston. And just so everybody knows about Boston. It's a special place because that's how they uh, start with the uh, American, what I believe. I think Boston is a great city. Too much. Too much giving people stuff. I had to work for what I, for what I got. I was born, I was, matter of fact, I was born on the street. And then I moved here because my husband was in the service, so. But I love it here. Too many people now? Too many people? I don't know. I don't know what more I could say about it. The Italians, yes they did. Yes, I'm a Republican. What do you think? <laughs> Good. One word. Obama. He's not 
under all that? Giving everybody free stuff? No, no. I worked. My parents worked. My mother was sick. My father worked in the shoe factory. And I did too when I was a kid. Now, let's put it this way. I told you I'm a, what do you call it? I'm a right wing. And it wouldn't hurt me if the clan came back. Sorry. Nothing against black people. I have black grandkids. Nothing against that. It's the people who come here. But make me nervous. That's the way it is. When I think of an American, I don't think of it in terms of how long you've been here or what your blood quantum is or, you know, uh, native or non-native it's sort of to me it's a spirit of um, self-sovereignty you know of believing in your capacity to uh, to survive you know I mean like I said I was over in Europe and this this person said to me you're not like other Americans and I said yeah I said, I'm a real American. You're looking at a real American here, and you can tell because I'm not afraid of everybody and everything. That's, to me, a real American is not afraid, you know? Is, is, it, you can handle it, you know, whatever comes at us. And if it's Im immigrants, you know, it seems to me that you would say, come aboard, you know? We're, you know, we're having a party here since, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's really based on fundamental things that are actually a lot of Native American philosophy. People who are afraid are easily manipulated and they're susceptible to um, strongman types like Donald Trump, so, you know. That they can they, they latch onto them because it's all about the fear. I mean, I'm I I'll, I'll tell you a story. Like I grew up uh, raised by people, many of them born in the 19th century, and they knew how to take care of themselves, and they taught us how to take care of ourselves, and so. I took off and started walking around this continent when I was, uh, I don't know, 16 years old. And I hitchhiked back and forth across this continent six times. And up and down God knows how many times. And I've met the people, I rode my bicycle across and I've met the people in, in this country and they're great. You know, they're fantastic people. I remember somebody said to me, when I, they said, did you ever, ever have any close calls when you were like riding your bike cross country? I said, well, there was a woman blowing kisses at me from her truck in Georgia. But I, I you know, I got through that. <laughs> As a married man, that was a little dangerous, but I managed. South Korea. Busan City, Korea. Always uh, I have when dreams come to this country because we have uh, um, opportunity, something we do not have in Korea. The most uh, difficult thing was the language because uh, 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 when I came 1975, there were too many Koreans. Anybody, even myself, or even prisoner, even anyone, again, they broke the law, they should get the punishment. But I know when I raised my two children, they break the law, they get punishment.
because I love this country, but because we have so much resource and the kind people and all different races. And that's why this country is so strong. Many people say American is a like uh, not doing well. American is not like it used to be. America is all oh, down the hill. Oh, so much negative things to say. But there are a lot of good things that happen too. We have so much um, opportunity this country has. And uh, don't waste it. that it, it, it says Paul Revere right on the bell itself. So we know that it was. There are only, I think there are 13 or 14 that are documented that are still in existence of uh, the Paul Revere bell. Let me, uh, let me bring it once here. Ever since 1870, when the, um, the clock was installed, people have been leaving their names and initials uh, when they uh, had anything to do with the uh, steeple or the clock. 1904, 1921, 1924, 6, 1960, 1934, 1922. I think there's some over here. Here's 1898, uh, uh, 1906. And a lot of these names are, are people you'd recognize uh, from uh, the Whitney's to And my two children are very successful. And my older daughter is an artist. She is a singer and a pianist and acting. She's doing well. My younger daughter is a U.S. Coast Guard Lieutenant Commander in San Francisco, in the San Francisco uh, port. And I'm here for finishing my a degree for psychology so I can help people and the community. I love Maine, especially um, uh, this area, Machias, Machias Port. Remind me so much, used to be my hometown, my home in Korea. And I around surrounding oceans, the rivers, farming, and the forest, meadows. Nature is around, surrounding me. It's a, it makes me smile every day. And uh, it was a huge event for the village. And, um, and from the foundation right up to every stage, I would run up this little hill. It was about a couple hundred yards away from the village. And um, run up there, take a photograph. The kids got a kick of me kind of trucking up and then coming back down again. So we were a month or so into this project, and Amir Khan and his entourage comes out. He is, you know, he's standing and watching, and then he finally walks up and he said, you are running back and forth, running. You run very much. And he says, I think you must, you must be very tired. I said, well, no. I said, you know, I'm not that tired. I said, it's okay. I, I, I'm, 
I'm out of shape, but I, I enjoy the running. Yeah, I need it, you know, and he says, ah, oh, then maybe you would like to race me up the hill. And, and of course, I, and I'm giving you the, transla the translation of my interpreter would be carrying this back and forth. And when he says this, the, you could hear in, um, among the kids and the people, ooh, they were getting a really big kick out of this exchange. And that was the point at which you know, I'd been there for several months in the village and I knew that he wasn't going to ever kill me or do anything crazy like that. So I thought, okay, this is where I have to cross a line. I have to try to bring this relationship to a new level. So I said, I said, oh, I'm your Khan. I said, I, you know, I'm a guest here. I don't have a whole lot to lose. These are your people. They look up to you. And I just beg you, take back the challenge because I don't want you to be shamed in the eyes of your people because I'll just I'll just whip you in that competition there's you know I, I you look and I said you look tough I said but I know and I so I went up to him and I started grabbing his arms and I was rubbing his belly you know your limbs are actually and I was I was using these various kind of descriptive poetic insults about your belly is like a bag of yogurt and you're and, and as they were translating people were like oh they were just watching listening to this and howling you know and he was like looking at me and and I went and then I said all this this litany of you know of challenge about how I'm more masculine than he is and then I, and then I finally said I, I refrained I said I said Amir Khan take back the challenge save your dignity do not challenge me to this race you know and then we were like oh and he looks back at me and he <laughs> and he grabs me and hugs me and shakes me. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I'm going back and forth. And, and that was like a turning point in our relationship. And it, it was so great. And so in the future meetings, like occasionally, we'd be little quips back and forth at, at our village elders meetings where, you know, we would have a, you know, we would talk and, and we'd be exchanged going back and forth. And then I, would, and then I might say something like, no, I would like Amir Khan to speak up because I know that when I'm usually around, he gets intimidated by my presence. And, ah! <laughs> it lasts, and then he'll say things like, he'll walk past me and says, don't worry, I will not hurt you, you know, and so that was wonderful. My, my relatives been tracked back to the 1700s and uh, I'm Scottish on both my mother and father's side, so. Yeah, my first port of call uh, when I was in the Navy in the Middle East was Bahrain and it was during Ramadan, which is a very sensitive time over there. And, but to see cities the size of Boston shut down to pray had an had a impact on me. And uh, I can't say it was for the good, for the bad, but it, it, it very much made me question Western religion uh, and who's right and who's wrong. Because when you see this many people have this kind of faith, uh, it, it's... It was very serious to me. It, it, it really gave me another perspective on the world, actually. Well, they left Scotland because of the, the, probably the potato blights and, and the things that were going on in Europe at the time, that uh, there was a huge influx into uh, Eastern Canada, Nova Scotia, of Scottish, Scottish dissidents. So. Well, I don't think there's a black and white or a, a you know, a right or wrong on the whole immigration issue. But uh, when you look at what's happening in Syria and how many people have been displaced, I do believe that the world has a responsibility to stand up and and help these people. Uh, of course, the, the uh, razor blades edge of that is who's a terrorist and who isn't a terrorist. And I think that we've seen in our own country that somebody doesn't have to come from 6,000 miles away to be a terrorist. I see the need, I, I see the need for immigration and, it, and I do believe, and I may be old fashioned, but America is a melting pot. It's what's made us, what, what has made us great for the past 270 some years. So. I, I really believe that 
immigration is important and we should have an open mind, a safe open mind for immigration and, and the things that it, the, the people that it brings. Uh, statistics show that it adds to our economy. Uh, a lot of new businesses are, 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 are immigrants and, and that's what we continue to need. I think there's been a I think there's been a huge fear spread through our country as well. There, there definitely should be cause for concern about the terrorism issue. But I think that um, I think that immigration as a whole should should be something that survives in America and do it in a safe way and and welcome these people and all people into our nation. It's not free. People say free country. I don't understand. This is not free country. We ancestor fought for this. We had uh, so many people already suffered, killed, keep this uh, our peace in this country. So it's not free. We have to pay back. But way to pay, pay back is we have to be happy and uh, be uh, thankful. I'm Lieutenant Senior Grade Jack H. Taylor, U.S. Navy, from Hollywood, California. I was captured December 1st by the Gestapo. Two American officers, at least, have been executed here. Here is the insignia of one, a U.S. Naval officer. Here is his dog tag, and here is the army officer, executed by gas in this locker. Here is what the camera crew found inside. Open borders in all the European countries are destroying their countries. And it, sh it shouldn't be allowed to happen here. I won't stand by, and neither will anybody else I hang out with will allow this country to be destroyed like that. All I can say is I wear my SS every day. It's family related. Well, my initial reaction is rage. And then when I think about it for the 30 seconds it takes me to calm down and things like that, it, it breaks my heart. I've got a, my father's 96 years old, fought in World War II. I uh, have a good friend in Grand Lake Stream who's 96 that spent World War II in the nose of a B-17. These guys' hearts are broken, and they sacrificed a lot for this country, and their hearts are absolutely broken. When I served in the war, enlisted in uh, the Navy in, when I was 17 years old with permission from my parents, 
and I went to boot camp in upstate New York, Sampson, New York, right near Seneca Lake, if you know where that is, in the winter, and that was cold. Ooh. And uh, different places where women wa kept watch during the daytime. There was two or three places all along the little town here. And then the men kept watch at night. And you had on the wall papers telling you what to look for. And I can remember of going with my mom to those places to set sometimes when we weren't in school. And uh, one was in the middle of the town about where the, the Westland Church is, and it was up on the hill. One was down at Loon Point on a, on a hill there. And the other one, Beals Island had this in the old schoolhouse at the top. And you watched, someone was watching 24 hours a day. It was a Saturday night. So when they came ashore walking and people were coming back from the movie hall and Ellsworth and stuff, they realized they was meeting a couple of men that weren't dressed like them and they was dressed much better than they were. So they reported it. And they followed those men from Ellsworth and picked them up in uh, New York. And I graduated from there, and they sent me to San Francisco, where I boarded a troop transport, the USS President Jackson. There were five of them that went in the Pacific during World War II, five presidents, ship President Adams, President Monroe, President Jackson, this and that. And two of them were sunk at the first battle they were in in Guadalcanal. Two of those transports were sunk. And you were concerned about immigration? Okay, well, where I grew up in New Jersey, we had every nationality known to man. We had, you know, Irish, Italian, Jewish, blacks, whites, you know, we had everything we could use and everybody got along. On the holidays, what eats? We went to the Polish neighborhood, we went to the Italian neighborhood, and we ate until we couldn't stand it anymore. And now, I have my same old friends whose grandfathers and grandmothers came from Italy and Ireland and hardly could speak the language, and, and now they're complaining about immigrants. I don't get it. <laughs> we're, all, we're all a certain amount of immigrants. We've all, you know, unless we're Native Americans, we all came from somewhere else. All right, maybe you're born in America and you're an American, but we have a descent, and they are immigrants. And and not all of the time were us immigrants nice to each other or to the rest of the world, but but we made it. When the tribe started doing business, especially with the state legislature, they needed some sort of a logo or tribal emblem to go by, and that was one of the earliest ones that I remember. And uh, we're people of the Pollock, that's what Passamaquoddy means, anglicized Passamaquoddy, but our real name is Pescaramukadi, so that would be it. Way out there, they call them the wolves. And there are cliffs there. They used to have Indian encampments that had to do all the fishing. Okay. You know, before people had to vacate. All the way from uh, St. Andrews up further, all the way down to probably southern Maine somewhere, just traveling, fishing, camping, 
It wasn't until I don't even know what year. If I had to, if I had to pinpoint a year that we were um, hoarded in, like <clears throat> on the reservation, now we had boundaries that we had to stay within. I don't really know the year of that. Before contact and after contact. Yeah, German. My grandmother had a boyfriend. They weren't married. That was her boyfriend. And he was said to be in a prisoner of war camp in Princeton, Maine. And then when the war ended, I don't even know when that was, he was released and he ended up having different families here like three different families at Pleasant Point alone. So that guy was uh, pretty popular, I guess. <laughs> it sounds kind of funny to me. You know, I mean, there are a few uh, pure, full-blooded Native Americans here and they're the true, Ameri they're the true people here, truthfully. And that's it. That's all I have to say about it. Uh, well, my dad told me that back when we had our, our war against England trying to become our own country, the Loyalists came up here and they, it was near winter. So they wanted to um, just stay here until they can travel back to England. And so they asked, and it's, it's a written document and agreed that they would stay here for a short amount of time, just through the season, and they would pay the Passamaquoddy people so much money, and um, they just never left. Someone figured it out that at this point, whoever they are from, their government would owe us $13 million, would owe the Passamaquoddy people today $13 million. Um, they, they never left. They came here, they asked if they, if they could stay, they wrote out an agreement, and they never left. So I'm Passamaquoddy, born, literally born, raised right here in Maine, Pleasant Point. I am also English on my father's side and German on my mother's. So he's very, very much into preserving our culture and that's wonderful. Um, my mom, on the other hand, she speaks fluent Passamaquoddy and never taught any of us because growing up she was beaten for speaking it. Um, we had a Catholic-run school on the reservation, and it was frowned upon. If any of them spoke any Passamaquoddy, they would get hit with rulers or however they did their punishment. And um, my mom was a rebel, and she would speak it despite them. Both my grandfather and his friend were war veterans, and they were good enough to put their life on the line for our country, but not good enough to have rights, basic human rights. And I think that is, that's a very, very sad tragedy um, because I have a lot of respect for the men and women that fight for our country. And so, after the death, after the murder, and after everything that had happened on that evening in 1965, they did try to get these men convicted of murder. They 
wanted justice. They wanted justice for their family, just like anybody else would, and it never happened. It, it was a long, long time that they were in battle in the courts for it, and nothing happened. Um, it was barely an investigation. And um, my grandfather hung himself when my mother was 16. And my uncle, when he was 21, shot himself. They just could not get over this tragedy that they had witnessed. Um, and so I would say for my mother, it would be very a very traumatic experience to live with that, to experience it. And so whenever, I, now I understand why she called them hunters, why she would call non-Native men hunters that wanted to come on reservation and find women for whatever reason, to marry them for one night, it didn't matter. They were hunters in her eyes. And it became less of, in my head, a racist term or a funny way for her to describe someone and more of a reality, a tragic reality that she had to experience as a child. Soon after I learned all of this information, I happened to be visiting my parents on reservation and a man came to the door and I had answered it and he was asking at first about my father's broken down truck in the yard. Um, I didn't know any information, so I asked my mom to come to the door, and she talked to him for a while, and, and he asked, do you know of any single women? It was like reliving, I would think, that whole tragic event back in 1965. Do you know of any single women? Immediately. She turned him away, sent, uh, called my dad up because he was in another room and um, told him what happened. I just can't imagine the thoughts that my mom was having at that point. I mean, who does that? Who, who goes to some random person's house and say, hey, you know any single people I could date? It's just, it doesn't happen that way. Once you've been here for six, six months, a year, working straight and contributing to the community is a good thing. I think it helps the economy and helps people overall because um, this should be a way you can communicate with everybody, not just your own race. It makes America good. The food end of it was a common a common denominator and holidays because of course the Jewish folk we had oh those holidays are different than our holidays so we can go over there and it, you know and they can come over to our house when it's our holidays and we learned about the cultures we learned about what grandma did and 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 the, like I said it, it was a great learning experience about what's going on in our world. Um, my name is Jenny. I am 12 years old. Uh, for 
photographer and a traveler. Okay, I was born here in the United States. Here in Maine, there's not many like, like racism and kind of stuff like that. So I, I think it's fine. Uh, actually, my grandmother and grandfather uh, owns it. Well, see, I feel like anyone can be American as long as they live here and they call it their home. I, I don't think they should like judge people by their color or their nas nationality because, I mean, some people come here and they work all their life and they do really th call this their home because if you go back to their where their nationality really was they they don't have nothing over there because they've spent their lives here doing what they dreamed of Just thinking, uh, a few years back, I heard about the first ever uh, world incidents uh, from global warming or climate change of people being basically climate refugees. They they had to leave their native lands because sea level rise made their groundwater brackish and their fields were, uh, you know, not going to grow any food anymore. So there was no way they could survive. Uh, and my two cents on this whole immigration thing is more of a long view where I think the bigger picture is what's going to happen a couple generations from now, two to three generations in the future where, you know, you can just look at Hurricane Irma or any other current weather event and, and uh, you know, globally too and see that uh, with, with weather getting worse that it's not going to be long before there are, are going to be major redistributions of population. There are only a few ways to circumvent this, and we have a very short window of time to do it. A climate refugee uh, is loosely defined is anyone who needs to uh, change where they're living because of the effects of climate change. And the causes of people uh, having to flee, having to leave their homes, can be every, anything from um, storms. And that might not be one single storm, but it might be a series of storms, you know, increasing in strength and, and increasing in frequency. Um, it can also, we're seeing a lot of changes in uh, where people live because of drought in Africa right now. And that's causing a lot of upheaval, a lot of people moving. So we're seeing a series of, um, of storms coming across the Atlantic. And it's very likely that the strength of these storms is increased as a result of a very warmer than normal Atlantic. Uh, and so the refugee problem is something that isn't going to happen to us gradually. It's going to happen in a variety of places in a lot of different ways around the world. Uh, and remembering that is really, really crucial. And the other sort of 
safe haven that people have, have gotten to in their heads is that it's gradual, it's going to happen over time, and that the planning we need to do for it can happen, you know, we can envision what's going to happen 20 years and 30 years and 40 years into the future, and the fact of the matter is we need to know what we're doing with uh, people who need to move out of their homes now. We need to look at the downtowns of all our little towns built along the coast and decide uh, how really soon how we're gonna you know uh, continue to have economic viability in our in our little bergs along the rivers and the shores our family goes way way back on, on the sea we have sea in our veins fishermen where uh, everything you can see to do with the sea draggers we've we've done everything Lobsters and scallops and urchins and stuff. It would be something come in take over. I don't know, but if we lost the lobsters, economically would be it'd be done. Uh, and so, not only are people, you know, it's not only going to be the sort of people whose home is destroyed or burned down or flooded. Um, but it's also businesses that are going to need to move and whole economies and whole um, cultures. And so uh, there's a lot of work to do and we haven't been doing it enough thus far. Oh yes, yeah, all fishing. Um, our, our whole family was uh, in the heron industry back then. Now, my grandfather immigrated from Germany. Uh, my grandmother was Hungarian, and that's about all I know. Well, after the war. It's fine as long as it's a certain number. Like when you got mass immigration, it causes problems. You know, when it's uncontrolled and just allow everybody in, every, every peasant, every poor person with no skills, it just... It's hard on the system. I think they should take, go over there, it's their country, okay, give them guns, teach them how to fight, and go get the country back. Okay, don't just bring them over here, give them free money and a place to stay. It's their shit, go keep it. Um, I think it would be scary. I would be nervous. I'd be like, oh, wow, they're taking my home away. Um, yeah. Gene Sherbin and Rene, we just called him Sherbin. From Haiti, as he came up here on a visa, illegally worked up to like 90 days and everything like that, so had two or three jobs. He went to church with us, and we had just developed that. and. What's his goal? He wants to be a pastor, and he also wants to at some time immigrate from Haiti. The reason he comes up here is for a short period of time he can visit and travel, and he can also have side jobs. And what he makes up there, what he makes up here per hour, he can make in one week what it costs him to live down there for a month. It's like it was roughly around 10 bucks an hour up here. And that's good, and it's like, it's just really despair in a lot of Haiti, areas of Haiti since the hurricane or the earthquake or whatever it was that hit down there. No, there's no reason to send anybody away. When we have a country where there's so much uh, natural resource wealth and, and so little people per, um, per capita. We didn't like what was going on with the Italian people. So a lot of them just came here. You come here, you work, hey, that's good for you. 
I don't I had heard I think one time somewhere where they used to put the Italians in a but I can't say for sure they used to put them in a pl a house or something a place to keep them am I right Well, if their parents are illegal, they should be sent back. I don't know. Because I thought as long as you was bear, uh, born on American soil, you become an American citizen. Now, if you was uh, illegal aliens having a son or a daughter in American soil, as far as I know, you're, the, the daughter and the son is American citizen. I don't think that it's fair that they come to this country and they get food stamps, main care, everything else. It's not right. He's turning 60. He don't have any health health insurance. And because he works part time, he's gonna pay five hundred five hundred dollars a month for insurance. If not, he gets penalized. They can walk right into DHS and get free health care. Yeah, it's kind of the feel. I mean, look at the guy that's down at the end here. So he's the same thing. He's living in a camper. I mean, I'm staying at my ex-boyfriend's garage because we can't afford anything. Uh, I know many people who have uh, brought back wives from other countries when they've gone to serve our country overseas, they've brought back wives from foreign countries. And many of those wives have become citizens of the United States through the proper channel. They, they take whatever course it is to get their papers. Like Harold was saying about his grandpa, it took him four years in the process. He's got a stack of documents like this of what he had to go through. I believe that they're American. They're 100% they're American. And, and to say anything different or to look at it in any other way is, is silly to me and arcane. So these people have been here. They're, they have no other home. There's no other place for them to go. And uh, they're Americans, and they should be treated as such. I'm quite racist, actually. Don't think they should mingle with other colors. I, it, it, lessens the whole, it lessens the culture in both sides, ours and theirs. You know, mixing blood is just bad. It's not right. They should be doing their own thing. The affirmative action stuff, okay? All the blacks are in tearing up their own neighborhoods, just like they did in Watts. The only people that are screaming for racial equality are the inferior races. Strongly that what happened in Charlottesville this weekend was just abhorrent and did I had I not shown up I would have felt complicit as if I was saying it was okay for these actions to occur and it's not okay we all have to stand up against hate and uh, this was my way of being able to do it There's a, a fear of the unknown, there's a fear of cultures that may behave differently than um, you know people are used to seeing. And as a result of that, they become fearful and uh, being afraid causes them to behave in a hateful manner. And I think this whole thing, we have a president who is incendiary and is inciting this kind of behavior in lots of people that, so he's given permission in my mind for people to now express these horrible feelings and uh, yeah, it's, it's really disturbing to me.
But I think one of the things that I think about when I think of myself as a real American is that I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of whatever comes, you know, down at, you know, and I'm not afraid of immigrants. And uh, I'm not even afraid of Donald Trump. So when, when they know you're from Lebanon, they always want to be cautious. And, and, and you really, honestly, I, I'm happy when, when they, they do extra search on somebody coming from the Middle East. I'm happy because my kids live in this country. They speak only, uh, you know, English, and and I, I I don't want them to 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 go through, you know, a terrorist attack. I I have to say, I mean, you know, from all the countries I I I have visited, and I have visited many countries, the the most welcoming country on the planet to 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 foreigners is, is the United States by far. And hopefully this will never change. Uh, and, you know, but, uh, and, and living here in, in, you know, in Maine, I mean, this is, has been the most welcoming place, but, but, you know, I mean, we live in a very, in a very friendly, in a very friendly area, I mean, uh, we probably uh, live in the most welcoming place on 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 the planet. So, uh, and people here—I mean, you don't need me to tell you—I mean, people here are extremely nice, extremely respectful, and 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 uh, you know, we never had we never had any 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 issue or or any any problem, not even minor. And people around here is very kind. They always have a time to, moment to say hello to each other. Okay. The man that I helped from Haiti was a person up here on a visa. He came up, he was walking, looking for a church one day. We stopped and we met, picked him up, went to ours, and we developed a friendship. We learned to communicate using uh, Google Translate on the computer on some things, and we just, there's natural things that come and do it. And it was just a wonderful growing experience for us. We have a... Uh, what seems to be like now a lifetime friendship where it seems like we've always been friends. And I had a party at my house one time on New Year's Eve. You could call it United Nations party. There was people from Jakarta, Africa, uh, France, India. They was all from our, in our company. We all worked together. We got along. I call them my friends. You know, they, I mean, some of them, let's face it, there's a lot of nice people, no matter where they come from. But if you don't want to talk to me, you don't want to this, you don't want to that, what can I say? I've done a fair amount of traveling. I've worked on sailboats and I've been everywhere from here down to the British Virgin Islands, you know, uh, sailing and meeting people. And that, what I learned about those other cultures helped me so much learning when I was in my travels to accept people. And once you showed them respect, they opened up the doors for you.